how a differently evil adolescent girl goes through menstrual hygiene management. Well, viewers, this is the Maternity Show on African Renaissance TV, and we join the world on this episode to commemorate the World Menstrual Hygiene Day with, of course, the Girls' Agenda. The Girls' Agenda has been one CSO that has done a lot in terms of menstrual hygiene management in the Gambia. So joining me on this episode is Aminata Jayate, of course, a young, vibrant Gambian who has so much passion for helping young girls in the Gambia. Aminata, you're welcome to the Maternity Show. Thank you so much, Sona. It's a pleasure to be here, to join you on this show, to talk about issues that I am so much passionate about at the Girls' Agenda. Thank you, Aminata. Um, at this point, we're tempted to say thank you so much for all the work you've been doing in the Gambia, for girls, of course, going to school, and other girls in the communities. But before we go into our discussion proper, mm -hmm. we would like to know what really you know, um, motivated you to join the Girls' Agenda, and of course, why is the Girls' Agenda focused on menstrual hygiene management? I mean, one of your focus areas um, is on menstrual hygiene management. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Sona, for that question. Um, I think what motivated me to join the Girls' Agenda uh, can be linked to several factors in the Gambia. Personally, I have lived through some of those experiences, but I have also seen um, young people like me lived through those experiences. Um, um, in 2015, I had an experience of escaping child marriage, and moving forward, I, it was, I realized how voiceless a lot of young girls can be to escape some of those violations in our communities. So that was one of the basic or one of the major reasons that made me join the Girls' Agenda. But also having the passion to um, advocate for the rights of women and girls, and also using my voice at the community level to inspire and also um, encourage and motivate a lot of young girls to realize their potentials, but also having to escape through a lot of violations uh, have really inspired and also encouraged me to join the Girls' Agenda. And I must say, this has been one of the most fulfilling fulfilling um, passions I have ever ventured into, but also one of the most fulfilling experiences I have encountered uh, through the Girls' Agenda, looking at the work we do in the Gambia. and how I am able to live on a daily basis to fulfill my desires or potentials to inspire and also impact lives at the farthest communities in the Gambia. Um, that is quite a motivation. And looking at the work that we do, let's explore what work the Girls' Agenda do in terms of menstrual hygiene management in the Gambia. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Sona. Uh, when you talk about the girls' agenda, you realize that in terms of women empowerment, in terms of advocacy for young people in the Gambia, whenever you talk about those issues, girls' agenda's name will always be in, in the books. Yeah. So and I just realized you've been um, awarded <laughs> from the last few awards. <laughs> yes. In That's March, we won the SDDV Film in Impact Award, uh, the C Awards, which is um, one of the which is the first uh, national award to recognize the potentials of women and the work that women are doing in the Gambia. And going back to advocacy on menstrual hygiene management is one of the one of the many thematic areas that the Girls' Agenda looks into. Mm -hmm. And marriage, teenage pregnancy, advocacy against teenage pregnancy, laws on sexual violence, and entrepreneurship, leadership training. We have a whole lot of activities that we do at the Girls' Agenda. So menstrual hygiene management is one of the critical components that we uh, that we work on mm -hmm. at the Girls' Agenda. And it has been more than seven years now. The Girls' Agenda have been doing work on menstrual hygiene management through the production of reusable pads, reusable sanitary pads, through, the product, through trainings at the grassroots and at the community level, but also through advocacy in, um, in establishing worse facilities in schools, especially by the government and also very important development agents. So mm -hmm. the Girls' Agenda have worked in almost all the regions in the Gambia to advocate, but also to train. And as we speak, we have more than 5,000 beneficiaries, mm -hmm. especially adolescent girls, who have been trained on menstrual hygiene management, but also on how to make reusable sanitary pads, which is which is a sustainable way of um, beating period poverty in the Gambia. Sure. And um, looking at your seven years of experience all along, how would you now then describe the status of menstrual hygiene management among girls, especially girls that are going to school? Okay. So basically speaking, even if, even before we look at research articles or research materials on the status of uh, menstrual hygiene management, you look at the, the situation of a lot of 
us that have grown up in typical traditional communities mm -hmm. or in typical cultural setups where access to some of these facilities are a major problem. And it's not only access to the facilities, but also looking at critical information on how to manage our periods or what to expect when we see our periods. Like most of us have lived through those um, challenges in our communities. And also going back to the national statistics a few years back, the Ministry of Basic and Secondary Education did um, a survey sort of, and it was established that uh, looking at the population of girls in school, over 20% of these girls miss out from school due to period poverty or due to unhealthy mental experiences at home. So we are seeing 20% every year is missing out from school, or but the population of girls are missing out from school mm -hmm. just because of a natural process that uh, we don't even have control over, yeah. that we don't even have to choose for ourselves is something that is very um, pathetic in our communities. So if you're missing, if 20% is missing every year and you have public holidays added to that, you have events added to that, you have uh, a lot of public events added to that. So you realize that a lot of girls are missing valuable hours um, in school because just because just because they menstruate yeah. and if you also look at the situation of girls in these particular schools especially in the um, in the rural communities most of these schools also do not have um, safe spaces where girls can take care of their of, take care of themselves when they are seeing their menstruation or experiencing um, unexpected flow at school so most of these girls this are also one of the reasons that they wouldn't feel comfortable to come to school because those um, services are not also available in school mm -hmm. to help girls manage their periods when they come in school. And that being the case, because of the stigma, you realize that a lot of girls will prefer to stay, stay at, home. at home. Yeah, and so, the um, environments at home are I really also going to see. That. Sure. Mm -hmm. But um, looking at the aspect of stigma, per se, and this mostly we would want to attach it to um, the differently able, let's say the ones that are hard to see, for example. So or have physical challenges, maybe. Yeah, exactly, something like that. Mm -hmm. So, and these are people that have also been part of our school system at some point. Have you gotten a special package for them, you know, in terms of your um, advocacy to see that they are not missing schools? Because one of the team, um, one of the things that I like about the team for this year's commemoration, like um, making menstruation a fact of life by 2030, 30, yeah. it's that the goal is telling us that menstruation should not be a reason for you to miss out. From school. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, and if, if people are missing out of school as a result of stigma that they face, maybe because they feel that somebody must have seen a blood stain on their clothes or so, mm -hmm. I mean, what are we doing towards that? Okay, thank you very much for that question. Uh, disability rights is something that I am so much passionate about, and I can say the girls' agenda is also so much passionate about. And I'm glad to tell you that for the past, uh, is it three to four years, we have incorporated uh, disability-sensitive needs in our policies, but also in our activities. Mm -hmm. When you look at the work that we do, if you watch our videos, let's say seven years back, and you look at our media content, let's say three years back to c coming down to date, mm -hmm. you will see a difference. Initially, we were not uh, doing sign language interpretations for our products. We were not doing, we were, not, we were having special, special programs for the disability communities, which I have to acknowledge. Mm -hmm. But we are investing more now, which is really progressive. Um, at the Girls' Agenda, we have, I am the disability focal person that I have to mention. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the disability focal person at the Girls' Agenda also. Right. So, uh, I am always I am always sensitive and like whatever we do I am like this has to be part of it this disability company has to be part of it mm -hmm. and at some point everyone is like you are so crazy over this but that was um, that is to show you how important the girls agenda appreciates diversity in the work that we do because if, if you are talking about making menstruation a normal fact of life by 2030 we have to be very inclusive in our activities and also consider the needs of persons living with disabilities. Because these are girls that face multiple discrimination. It's for the fact that they are girls, they are, some of them are living in traditional communities or rural communities, mm -hmm. but also their disability causing for a discrimination for them. So we had this grant, which is currently, which we are currently, currently wrapping up. It's a three-year grant from the Global Fund for Women, and it's a leadership grant. Under this grant, we had a special component for the disability community. We had a special program. Uh, um, for over, is it six months, for the St. John's School for the Deaf, but also for other disability 
target targeted populations. Mm -hmm. We organize special training programs for them to learn how to do part productions and how to make reusable parts, but also to have sensitization programs incorporated in the activity. During the sensitization programs, we hire sign language interpreters who are specifically um, who are specifically assigned this role throughout the training. So each and every day we are having this particular training. There must be a sign language interpreter who will be doing direct communication with this um, targeted participants, especially girls. Um, also, we have um, we have done activities commemorated activities with them, mm -hmm. celebrating menstrual hygiene management, they were also supplying them with reusable parts. So this is a component that the girls agenda is so much particular about. And it was we had plans to also target the um, the Govi, that is the visual impaired in school. Vietnam. No, the one in Canifin, okay. the, the main one in Canifin. Mm -hmm. But um they had some issues internally, I think, in terms of getting us the required number of participants and the age cohort yeah. that was needed to target them for the particular program. That was why, at that point, the project could not go into that particular school. But we made a lot of efforts mm -hmm. to make sure mm -hmm. those students also benefit, who are part of those schools, benefit from such training programs. Mm -hmm. Also, we do um, media content or productions looking at thematic areas such as menstrual hygiene management or menstruation. Whenever we are doing it, we make sure there is sign language interpretation and um, subtitles for these media products or for these media contents. Yeah. And we incorporate their participants in these media productions or media content to also hear from their experiences and challenges they are faced with so when it I, comes to menstruation. I, um, that part is really very important because um, these are people that barely have the chance to understand, I mean, particularly on this aspect of health. I'm going to link it to health and because this is the maternity it's very, show it's and also linked, motherhood. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, in 2018, 2019, I've come across a study that has been established at um, St. June School for the Deaf. Mm -hmm. So you realize that these are people um, that do not have the chance to even come to school when they are going through menstruation mm -hmm. because their parents would advise them to stay at home. at home. So because they cannot even communicate pain somehow, mm -hmm. they do communicate, but we don't really understand, understand how they communicate the communication. Yeah, and the saddest true. part is their parents or their mothers cannot even talk to them in sign language. Because I've come across one person, she will have to write for her mother to understand. The mother did not go to school. school so, so it's more difficult. It's, it's very difficult for the mother to even talk to her about what seeks to take care of when she's going through menstruation. Mm -hmm. So that is why I've become so passionate about um, differently able adolescent girls when they're going through menstrual hygiene money because I, f I realize that as a normal person, I wouldn't say they are abnormal per se, mm -hmm. I go through a lot. The, the, the cramps and all whatnot, but I'm still able to talk to someone to feel okay. But how do we do that? becomes a crazy thing. It's a, it's a big challenge. Exactly. So that's yeah. why I'm always thinking of how they go through it in their various um, diversities. Yeah. So we're going to move from that um, a little bit, and then we look at specifically what you have done to achieve the theme of this year's um, commemoration, having um, menstruation as a fact of life by 2030 mm. so far. OK, thank you very much. Um, commemorating this month is not only about speaking up, but also taking action towards the the goal the goal for 2030 because 2030 is like six or seven years away it's already here yes yeah. it's already here so <laughs> it just looks far but it's it's not it's not far mm -hmm. so personally i believe whenever we we talk about these challenges or we talk about menstruation or menstrual challenges it has to go beyond just talking about it but Everyone has to take responsibility and we take critical action towards achieving the agenda for 2030. Because if we are to make menstruation a normal fact of life, a lot of things are also involved. Mm -hmm. It's about uh, dismantling um, negative cultural norms sure. or dismantling, dismantling patriarchal cultural norms in our communities. But also looking at investment, there should be adequate investment. And the government also has to take a lot of responsibility in making sure this is achieved. Mm -hmm. So what we do at the Girls' Agenda, or what we have, what we did the past, the past month, I will say, or commemorating Mental Hygiene Day, we did not only wait for the day to come, let's say 28 May, we, we started the advocacy since on the 1st of May. Mm -hmm. And if you go through our pages, you will see we have been doing quotes to talk to different people, to talk to our beneficiaries, to discuss about the impact of the TGA reusable parts. And we have our own pad brand, our own pad brand, which we call the TGA parts. Mm -hmm. If you look if you look at our parts, you will see it written at one of the edges of the part. And we have engaged the communities. We have engaged the communities. We have also held 
training specifically because at the girls agenda at the girls agenda's office we have a youth safe space aside the administrative office so the youth safe space the purpose is to hold um, sensitive conversations like menstruation mm -hmm. uh, sexuality teenage pregnancy these topics that are not discussed at home so at that youth safe space we have young people that come around and during the month we had adolescent girls and boys that came around and we had discussions around means so the first one was specifically for adolescent girls mm -hmm. <clears throat> we had the general discussion on menstruation and how it affects young girls with a health practitioner we also held training a basic menstrual a basic reusable part production training with young girls at this space where they, they learned basic skills on how to make reusable parts using local, local materials and the biggest event we had was to hold an intergenerational dialogue at the community in Brikama Nema because when when we look at menstruation also so now uh, we don't discuss about it with our parents at no, home at i remember growing mm -hmm. up and i didn't have some of these discussions with my mom at home the first mm -hmm. time i just realized was when i saw a stain on my skirt and my mom told me this is menstruation and this is how you have to take care of yourself <laughs> yeah, that's all. and the stories are very similar yeah. to most of our experiences <laughs> at home mm -hmm. so there is a lot of gap between our mothers and our daughters when mm -hmm. it comes to discussing about these issues because we are not used to it so when we when you don't start these conversations at earlier ages, when we grow up, it becomes very abnormal sure. for our parents, yes, to discuss with us mm -hmm. about these things. So we held an intergenerational dialogue where we had mothers come with their daughters, young girls, to have them on a common ground mm -hmm. to discuss about the stigma around menstruation, but also to discuss with them on the challenges that these girls are going through and how these challenges are even affecting girls in school in mm -hmm. terms of. Um, lack of concentration in school, missing out from school because of the stigma attached to it. So we held a very big event um, um, where we had parents come with their daughters to discuss about the menstruation and the stigma on Were men invited? Uh, men were not invited for this program. It was specifically like an intergenerational dialogue. So you will also realize that a lot of us at the community attach menstruation to be a woman's thing or just to be a girl's thing. Exactly. That's yes. why I was asking if there was a Yes. The, um, the invitation was general. Like, okay. say, it was an international dialogue. But at the community, whenever you talk about menstruation, our fathers are like, mm -hmm. So at some point, we have stigma around that area also, which I, I believe should also... Yeah, so we are going to look at that um, probably after this short break. Mm -hmm. For now, let's go on a break and we'll be back shortly. short break if you're joining us now this is the maternity show on african renaissance tv with me sona dabo and on this episode we are looking at menstrual hygiene management with the girls agenda of course aminata jaita representing them so before we went for that um short break aminata we were looking at the male component you know of uh, menstrual hygiene management because it's really important for us to have um mm -hmm. the male counterparts because at some point it's not just the young girls that go through this, but even married um, women, women will find it difficult yeah. to discuss with their husband what they go through when they're doing um, menstruation. They cannot even tell them if they are okay or not okay, what cravings they have, and mm. the man needs to understand all these things. Process. It is during this period that women would also have some frown faces mood and they wouldn't even want to, yeah. exactly, mood swings, <laughs> that's the right word, <laughs> and they wouldn't want to talk to their husband. But the man should also understand that this is why they are going through this. Mm -hmm. That's why it's really important we incorporate them in our activities. How far have you gone on that aspect? Okay. Thank you very much, Swana, for that question. At the level of the girls' agenda, our focus is more on girls when it comes to advocacy on menstrual hygiene management and also making reusable parts. Mm -hmm. Although we had some, but not very common, I have to be honest, mm -hmm. uh, activities or an activity that targeted both boys and girls. It was a project in 2019 with Amplify Change, um, Dono. We held it in Basse, I remember. Mm -hmm. During that training, the training, especially for the reusable part, was done for both um, girls and also young boys. 
and it will interest you that we have specific projects or programs for mm -hmm. persons in the madrasas or young boys and girls in the madrasa. Yeah. In the madrasa. Because most people don't remember this section of the population. We tend to forget them mostly and focus more on the conventional schools mm -hmm. when we're doing this advocacy. In that activity, we had uh, boys from the madrasa or young men from the madrasa benefiting from this reasonable part training and also girls on the same platform. Mm -hmm. But at the girls' agenda, the focus has been, let's say 90% of our interventions on menstruation or menstrual hygiene has been more focused on girl-led girl initiatives, mm -hmm. training young women or training girls on making reasonable part and parts and educating them on menstrual hygiene management. And I must admit that young men are very important, sure. especially in terms of understanding women and knowing the processes, the natural processes actually, that we go through in our homes, in our marriages. And because of this lack of mis lack of understanding, we are, in do we are in engaged in or involved in problems at the household level because men also don't tend to understand the processes that we go through. Without understanding, actually, these issues keep happening or these things come to us differently and we have different um, ways of reacting to them and how we respond to these things also are, dif are, are different. And most of these men are not also educated about these processes in their homes or in their households. So sometimes it's very different and it's very difficult for them to understand these things. And I must admit that this is a very important aspect that we also have to start investing more in and looking more into so as so so much so that so much so that we are advocating for this menstrual hygiene management. Yeah. Yeah. It's quite important that um, we have them in our settings as we um, advocate for a good menstrual hygiene management practice. Mm. So we're looking at menstrual hygiene management. What would you describe as a good menstrual hygiene management practice? I mean, we know it's not from the health side, but let's just try and see so that we can align this to your programs in your advocacy. Okay, so having a good menstrual experience have to do with a lot of things. It doesn't just have to be one fixed thing that you have to look at because we all live in different environments. We live in different communities. And it's good to also acknowledge or to um, say here that during our trainings, we have health experts and we have specialists in these areas that tackle this uh, interest issue. And we are so much concerned with having a good menstrual experience or having a good menstrual practice because these things are processes. Yeah. And the moment the menstrual experience is not held, it follows you down. And I'm glad that you even brought the issue of pregnancy because yeah. because the, because of the fact that most of us or most girls don't have good menstrual experience at home. You have issues are infections following them through, issues are rashes, and these things actually have an impact on our reproductive system. Exactly. So having a good menstrual experience is having access to quality information because you have to get the information to know actually what to do with your life. Mm -hmm. So the first thing has to do with access to information, quality information on how to manage your period yeah. and what to, when to expect your period. The and cycle. The cycle, the period yeah. cycle or the menstrual <laughs> calendar. I mean, maybe that is why... Exactly. That, that is why you're having the commemoration on the 28th day of the fifth month of the year. Of me. It's not by default, but <laughs> I know. that's how it came about. Yeah. Because mostly the, the average cycle of a woman is 28 days. Some mm -hmm. of us can have it for 25 days. Mm -hmm. Some of us can have it like for every 20 days. Some of us can have it for up to 35 days. Yeah. But the average period cycle 28. is 28 days. Mm -hmm. You understand? And the average number of month days can be five, five days. days. So that's how you have 28 May. 28 May. In every year. In every year. Nice. Yes. So it's not by default. Fault. Having a good menstrual experience also it's about having access to proper sanitary materials or products, yeah. um, which is one of the major reasons we came up with the reusable part, mm -hmm. because most of us also came from very poor family backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And affordability of sanitary parts is a major problem, but if you use the reusable sanitary parts, it's conducive and also it's a good financial, it's a good way of managing your finances because the part can go for less than one or two years mm -hmm. and you can you can continue using it. But also a good menstrual experience is about knowing how to use your part and how to also maintain it. Mm -hmm. Because for the sign that for the period parts at the shops you just buy, you use and throw. True, yeah. They're not just true uh, in any environment. Environment because it can it also cause yeah, yeah. other infections along the line. Along the line. Mm -hmm. And that one is easier to use. But for the reusable part you have to know how to use it for how many hours, let's say for example, how to wash it, how to how to clean it and how to also maintain it. Mm -hmm. Because you go to a certain house, it's even a taboo to dry your menstrual cloth outside, outside mm -hmm. or even at, at your backyard. If men are around you don't 
don't have to dry it. We have seen scenarios where girls are asked to wash their um, menstrual clothes and put towels on top of them to dry wow. because you are hiding from the men in your house that you're going through your menstruation or you, you, you're hiding from. <laughs> that's, that's weird. Yes. Because these things are supposed to be exposed to heat. To heat, exactly. And so growing up in those environments, you realize that, and these things are very, very much normalized. Yeah. You mm -hmm. see young girls you put in their wet sanitary materials on the bed sheets or on the, on the mattresses, putting them in, in bags. So all of these things are causing a lot of challenges when it comes to girls managing their periods. So it's about understanding how to manage your menstrual cycle, understanding actually your body as a young girl, yeah. when to expect your period, what signs do you see coming up for you when you're about to see your menstruation, how do you prepare for your menstruation, and also how do you maintain your materials after menstruation till the other menstruation comes. I mean, this but way you are not caught unaware in the midst of people. Yes. And you're not staying. And you're staying or you're not prepared for it mm -hmm. with all the stigma or this or, or the, this discrimination that comes along it. That's important. But also these schools have a responsibility of uh, incorporating these discussions in our science classes, let's yeah. say, per se, mm -hmm. or in our extracurricular activities, per se. Schools have to create these safe spaces or safe environments for young girls to access information and also to access services whenever needed and whenever necessary also. Yeah, so um, at some point we see that schools were supplied with sanitary materials, pads, but I don't know how that end up, mm -hmm. end, uh, ended up. It's not sustainable. Exactly. Either. But also, giving them sanitary parts is just one aspect. Aspect of it. Where are they going to do their changes? This is a million dollar question that everybody What facilities? Is. Exactly. You go to some facilities, both boys and girls are using it. Even though it's level, this is for girls, this is for boys, but still, both so boys use and girls. Anyhow. Uh -huh. So there's no water available for you to wash clean and then mm -hmm. use this part. What then happens to you? It's a crazy it's, world. It's crazy. Anyway. It's very clear. And this is a situation in many schools. We have seen uh, situations, I think, in, was it three years back? There was this survey that the girls agenda did with FIOH, Fisher in Our Hands, and I was one of the, the I was part of the team that was doing this over in schools. So you realize that even in some of these schools, the future in our hands even constructed, I think, some facilities in school. Yeah. I think UNICEF is also doing it. Mm -hmm. But how do the school make sure that this is a continuous project process? Now the donor comes and invests in a particular school. It's the responsibility of the government to make sure that this service is available to young girls. Mm -hmm. And you, you will even see scenarios where the toilet is here, there is no tap, and girls have to travel, let's see, up to the gate of the school. Mm -hmm. to so a very long distance mm -hmm. to fetch water. So this was even part of the challenges that the girls expressed. They said when they see their menstruation unexpectedly, there is no water to help them. And they don't have access to go all the way outside the school to go and fetch water because they're already stained. Mm -hmm. And some of these toilets don't even have uh, good doors. Yeah. They don't even have proper doors, sorry. And it's very difficult for these girls. So it's just a name to say we have this facility in this school, but how is it proper to take care of the needs of the girls? And in some situations you have people come uh, like you don't even get to understand that this is a real toilet facility Facile. or this is a real toilet uh, um, space. And to add girls. to the boarding, probably there will be no um, detergent for them to use. After There's that. no detergent, and in situations <laughs> we had, <laughs> we had situations where uh, someone said they were detergents, but the next time they checked, it was stolen. <laughs> so, but they're not even they're not even accessible, and even if they're there, when they finish. The, the project faces out. There is no sustainability mechanism adopted by place, the school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And most of the parts that the schools are supplying are conventional parts. Mm -hmm. They are not the reusable parts. The girls will use it and throw it dis indiscriminately in the environment, which yeah. will have an impact on us mm -hmm. and on the environment because diseases cannot come up through, through those things. And you understand? Decomposing yeah. those materials becomes a problem. Climate change issues here and there. Mm -hmm. So there is no sustainability mechanism in most of these schools to say when girls are going through their menstruation. This is because if you supply me a part this month, next month I come back. Why don't you give me a reusable, a reusable part? part? I use it, wash it, mm -hmm. come back with it to school the next month, and I can, and I can continue using it again. Now this is so tempting me to actually <laughs> ask what speciality you have in your reusable part <laughs> at this point. Because um, if, if you're talking about how they should maintain it or how they should use it. Maybe we should just look at that briefly for viewers to really understand how the reusable parts are made and then what our duration should a person use it and how do you even maintain it? It's okay. really important. Yeah, that's very important and it's a lot of education that comes with maintaining reusable parts and teaching girls how to make reusable sanitary parts. Mm -hmm. um, 
the reusable sanitary pad is one of the most sustainable period materials you can use as a young girl it's very comfortable it's very conducive and it's not difficult to make mm -hmm. you understand um the major challenge we have right now is getting access to um 100% or real cotton materials yeah. um, that you can use to make it. But we are improvising. Mm -hmm. We have um, some available in the Gambia, not up to the standard we might want it, mm -hmm. but we have the ones available in the Gambia, which we are really, really taking pride in because those ones are also very, very uh, working very much, working out very well for our girls because uh, they are made with cotton materials, it's very clean, it's hygienic, and it's a professional seamstress that does the training for the adolescent girls. Mm -hmm. So now we have a special initiative at the Girls' Agenda. In almost all our girls-led initiatives or activities, we incorporate the training of reusable part in that particular activity. That's Be it an empowerment camp from UNICEF, mm -hmm. be it a youth safe space activity that we have with any donor. But in as much as it's a girls led activity, the reusable sanitary part component budget comes in automatically as part of the training package. So we don't only train girls, we give them the supply also. We make sure every participant from the training has a supply, a packet. Um, I had totally forgot. Yeah, the, I could, could have, have brought, brought the sample. Let me see. That yes. makes it more lively. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> but it's fine. So, yeah. So, we have it really, really branded, branded very well. I think I should be able to show you pictures when we are done. Mm -hmm. And we can display it probably in the video. Yeah. Uh, we have it branded and put the logos of the Girls' Agenda on the back. We have it in a very nice bag. Mm -hmm. But inside that bag, we have five sanitary pads, reusable pads, and we have instructions also on, on how to use it. Yes, and nice. yes, on how to use it, but also what to do and what not to do. Like do not do not wash with bleach, do not wash with the local soap or more. Mm -hmm. Like those basic tips on how to maintain them also we have it incorporated as part of the material. So how long should this stay on your body? Yeah, so basically we, we are looking at five hours minimum, but others can even go up to six hours depending on your flow. Mm -hmm. Maybe for you the your flow might be too heavy and maybe you might just need to use it for two to three hours but yeah. others can go up to five hours because we don't have heavy flow mm -hmm. so because it's cotton it's very comfortable you don't have a lot of skin issues compared to the uh, the conventional part material mm -hmm. and the duration of the part can go up to two years you can use it if it's properly kept or maintained you mm -hmm. can use it and use it and use it for up to two good years without buying part so and personally that is what i am using no, that nice. is what so I um, how do you how do you clean this and maintain you know for it to go for two years is for an individual yeah so when we have the training like I said earlier we have the, the expert who explains to girls on how to clean the parts how to maintain like now when you use it immediately uh, you removed it you know you have blood in it mm -hmm. you need to put it in water like plain water and make sure that the blood goes out maybe you leave it for some time and allows allow the blood to to wash off on its own mm -hmm. then later you can use soap to wash it but we advise girls not to use like the hem and the local the locally made soap yeah not to use bleach because you know these things have impact on our skins yeah. and also it's unhealthy to be used on our genitals mm -hmm. and when you wash it until it is clean mm -hmm. uh, you can rinse it with warm water uh, and also normal fresh water, then dry it under the hot sun. If, if it's, uh, it's not feasible to, be, to dry it under the hot sun, let's say in the rainy season, for example, we don't have access to sun always, mm -hmm. you dry it on, and make sure it has access to fresh air mm -hmm. and nothing is put on it, you allow it to dry on its own, then later you iron it. Ah. Right. So ironing it is a replacement for the for the sunlight. for the heat here yeah, for the sunlight, mm -hmm. and maintaining it because when you see the part, it um, there is a way to wrap it because there is a clip at the end of it. So you turn it, turn it, and clip it to make sure nothing penetrates it. You put it in its back and tie the back very well. But the back also has to be washed to make sure nothing stains the part or no infection comes to the part. Mm -hmm. You keep it in a very safe space or a very safe environment until the next month then you continue using it nice um, that is how it works i would have loved that we explore more options <laughs> on this but i'm afraid that the time, the would time allow allow us. Us. so wrapping us uh, wrapping up quickly let us look at um your activities in line with the sdgs we can wrap up with that uh, how how is this supporting the sdg especially um good health Thank you very much. Uh, good health and well-being mm -hmm. is a very critical SDG component that we cannot ignore, mm -hmm. and I must say it's uh, part of the it's part of the major activities that we do, in consideration of maintaining good health and well-being. If you marry off a child or a girl, actually the girl will go through teenage pregnancy, mm -hmm. through um, 
premature labor, for example, or through those challenges, and it affects the girl's health and well-being. Mm -hmm. If you don't have healthy periods or healthier menstrual experiences, it affects your health and well-being. So almost most of the activities we do, or advocacy we do, is around maintaining good health and well-being, mm -hmm. advocating for gender equality, which is SDG 5, advocating for quality education, which is SDG 4. So all of these SDGs, are linked in one way or the other and advocating for good health and well-being also has a very critical component on the advocacy we do. Mm -hmm. We work with policymakers, which is very important to mention to advocate for um, more inclusive policies to advocate for the implementation of these policies that actually will have to positively impact on the health and well-being of women and girls in the Gambia and beyond. Nice. Um, <laughs> thank you very much, Aminata. Would there be anything that you want to say out to the viewers before we allow you go? Uh, all I have to say is to thank you, Sona, for having us at the Girls' Agenda. Mm -hmm. We highly appreciate the invitation and we look forward to more collaboration because your show, the Mandality Show, is so much linked to uh, most of the things that we do. Mm -hmm. And also to thank the entire team for the wonderful coordination, for the warm welcome <laughs> <laughs> and everything else. Mm -hmm. uh, just to say that we all have a responsibility mm -hmm. uh, to achieve or to make menstruation a normal fact of life by 2030. It's not the girls' agenda's responsibility alone. Nice. As communities, we have our responsibilities. As families, we have our responsibilities. Mm -hmm. As couples, we have our responsibilities. Uh, and it would be very important to have men, to see men come on board to take active roles in, you know, in making this process very normal for us because it's a natural process and this is not something we have to choose for ourselves. Mm -hmm. If you also want to learn more of the work we do, we are on social media, on Twitter, on Facebook, on TikTok, on Instagram, I think on most of the major social media yeah. platforms to <laughs> follow our work and everything. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much, Sona, for thank everything. Thank you, Aminata. Yeah. Thank you for honoring our invitation. It's a great pleasure having you, of course, to discuss with us uh, menstrual hygiene management, especially mm -hmm. on the team, um, making menstrual hygiene management uh, a normal fact, a normal of, fact life. of life by 2030. Mm -hmm. So we've all heard what Aminata has said. It's, she said it's the responsibility of everybody to make sure we make menstruation a normal fact of life by 2030. And mm -hmm. the girls' agenda have already started their work. It's left to you and I to play our quarter. Viewers, we are drawing the curtains on this episode right here. Until we come your way next, do not forget to subscribe, like, comment, and share our videos for more interesting episodes. Mm -hmm. Bye from us. Bye.